Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. My name is Elabaris, and welcome back to Let's Learn Root. And today, I'm very excited because we are just about to finish the tutorials, and it's time to learn about my favorite faction. Um, many of the people who have played with me will probably be able to answer pretty quickly that I adore the otters. I absolutely love their play style. I love the strategy that goes into playing them, the table talk, these decisions you have to make, how to sp how to spend every single action you play or uh, you have. It's such an interesting faction. I really enjoy it. However, it is also one of the easiest factions to tell who knows what they're doing and who doesn't. There are a lot of inefficiencies you can make while playing this faction. And it is my hope that during this tutorial, I mean, you're going to get a very brief introduction to them, but then over the following videos that you'll be able to get a better picture of how to properly play the otters uh, because it is, um, it's kind of rough seeing a lot of people that don't know how to play them and end up throwing what could be huge leads kind of into the dirt. So here we go, rolling on the river. Learn to play the River Folk Company. <clears throat> the River Folk Company has set up shop on the Great River running through the woodland. As the other factions purchase services, the River Folk will be able to fund new trade posts across the forest. The construction of these posts is a viable way to score victory points, but so too are dividends gained from hoarding wealth. Well, hey there, chum. Let me wash my hands real quick. They smell like clams. In the meantime, let's take care of setup for me and place four four warriors in clearings along the river. So, setup for otters is quite simple. You just place four warriors in any river clearing. You can divide your warriors between river clearings, or you can put them all in one. And it wants us to do to do that, or to divide two and two. Generally, you want to put your otters in one, because as you play the otters more, you'll find that having a gigantic otter, otter ball just roaming around the map is very efficient at completing your goals. We've got the best services in town. At the start of their birdsong, your opponents may purchase services by taking warriors from their supply and adding them to your payments area. You'll see here, bottom left, payments we have three otter funds in the payments box we start with three otter funds uh our first turn anyways with three otter funds in the payments box um those payments become the funds that determines the actions you can take on your turn so incoming payments are payments to you that happen outside of your turn uh, including the three you start with and then at the start of your turn they turn into funds Now, <clears throat> we didn't get to read over what all of these did, but effectively, people can buy cards out of your hand. The Riverfolk have a public hand, so anyone can see what is in their hand at all times. <clears throat> the Riverfolk uh, can then choose to price how many warriors um, the hand card can cost. So I could price here, as it says, set them all to three wants me to pray so it will cost uh, a faction three funds from their supply three warriors from their supply to buy a hand card river boats um is the allows the buyer for the turn that they buy on to traverse along the river usually this is not a very sought after service very rarely is it very rarely will you set this service price to three um because no one is ever going to pay three except for very very niche situations mercenaries is quite interesting uh, mercenaries is when the buyer can purchase the ability to use river folk warriors for the purpose of rule and for the purpose of battling you cannot move the river folk warriors but you can battle with them if you are in the or if you are able to battle in river folk clearings uh, you can you can battle with them and then you can also use them for rules. So cats, for example, if there's a bunch of otters on a on a clearing that the cats want to build in, the cats could purchase mercenaries and then 
build a build something because they technically rule it for that turn. Of course, if you have no one to defend it, that might be a bad idea because then the riverfolk can just kill it. But that's for just for the sake of an example. Setting them all at three is definitely playing hardball. Yeah, is anyone going to buy anything? No, people choose to buy. If they are going to buy, they can buy a service at the start of your turn. Generally, you can only buy one service unless you have an otter trade post in a clearing that you have a piece in. So no one has bought anything. Clearly, they're not enjoying the price of three here. Um, hopefully, we get some more uh, explanation here so I can play along. Our service prices were so steep that we didn't get any buyers. However, each game, we start with three payments represented by warrior icons. During Birdsong, you move all payments to your funds box to spend on actions during daylight. You can move, battle, and draw cards by committing funds. These funds move to your commitments area and won't be available to spend or commit again until your next turn. So committing funds, very important. Commit a fund to battle the marquee in your bunny clearing before they recruit more warriors. So we are committing a fund to battle. You ought to know better than to attack the marquee. Clearly not. Well done. You're more of a fighter than I expected. Recruit now in the clearing you battled in to replace the warrior we lost in battle. Recruiting is costly, and I will say very costly. Funds used to recruit go to your supply rather than your commitments. This means they won't return to your funds on the following turn. So this is where these first three actions are committing a fund. The recruit action spends a fund. The terminology is very important. Commit moves a warrior from funds to commitments. And then on your next turn, commitments will go back to your funds box along with any payments. Any warriors or any uh, funds you spend disappear. You do not get them back. So recruiting is very, very costly which is why it's very important to try and hold on to funds and use them very sparingly for the purposes of recruiting. You really don't want to be recruiting. You want to try every avenue possible to avoid recruiting, uh, including another action that you'll see later that will be very, very useful for us. So we spent a fund. Yikes. Unlike many other factions, you don't draw at the end of turn. To draw cards, you must commit a fund to use the draw action. This is what makes the Riverfolk Company one of, if not the best, factions for card drawing, uh, especially on the digital version, is that if you have a lot of funds, you can draw a ton of cards. So, during evening, you may change the prices of your services. Let's hold a sale. Bring down the river boats. Bring the cost of riverboats down to one and your other services down to two. So, we're going to talk about this real quick. Um, well, okay. So let's talk about this real quick. There is, and we can't see it right now because of this tag, but if no one buys a service from you, you will automatically get two warriors into two of your own funds, two of your own warriors as funds in your payments box. And then those funds will move to the funds box on your turn. So if no one buys from you. So what this means is you should never price anything at one after your first turn. Because if I put, if the cats buy river boats, I got one payment. If no one else buys anything next turn, I got one additional fund for my payments box. If no one had bought anything at all, I would have gotten two. So never price anything at one after your first turn. Before your first turn, pricing at one is actually very valuable, and not a lot of newer players realize this because you already start, as you saw, with three funds in the payments box, meaning any additional fund that we get from any purchase 
is a surplus fund. Surplus is not a, a, um, it's a term that the game uses, but you'll find more experienced Otters players referring to it as surplus just because it is surplus, and they'll count up their surplus and keep track of how much surplus they have. And when people play against the Otters, they will generally be pretty mindful of how many surplus funds they're giving the Otters. Any funds more than the Otters would get on their turn from what's called protectionism, which is if they get no payments, they get two funds. Um, any funds more than that is a surplus fund and can be a danger to the rest of the table if they give you too many surplus funds. So, all this is to say, past the very first turn, never, or past setup, and once you're finished your first turn, nothing should be priced at one, ever. Unless you've made some really weird deal with someone where they're going to buy like multiple times, like you should really never price at one. So anyways, that aside, those baked goods you have on offer look delicious. So the cats are going to buy bake sale coins. Now, another thing I want to note. So the cats effectively, the cats gave me two funds uh, as that are now in the payments box. So if, if the cats did not buy, I would have just gotten two funds in the payments box. So... One of the issues you can run into here is they just bought coins off me. That coins is a three-point craft. I am effectively getting the same amount of funds by them buying as I would if no one bought. So why am I giving away three points for effectively free for the cats? That's actually not a great idea. So if you have... Generally, the way pricing works is... And, and this will highly depend on who you're playing against. And this is part of what makes Otters a very interesting faction is how you set your prices. Because if one person buys for two, you're making an equal number of funds than if uh, no one bought at all. Because of your protectionism, again, is what it's called. Getting two funds into your payments box if no one buys. Um, so if you have a hand of okay cards but cards that might be desirable to other factions, such as the, the the cats, like bird cards, for example, because it gives them extra actions, and so do the birds, the birds, or the eerie, like, uh, like bird cards as well. And if you think you could get multiple purchases for two, that would be a great time to set your prices at two. And then you hope that both the cats and the birds buy, because then you get two surplus funds. Now, if you have valuable cards in your hand, that you don't want people to buy out without giving you an advantage, you should price it three. Coins, in general, is a valuable card. So usually, I would never price a, price a hand that has coins in it below three. Sometimes, there is the ability you would price at four, although that's a very steep cost. So you have to understand that almost no one is ever going to buy at four. The only time you really price at four, most of the time, outside of a few situations, is uh, at the end of the game when you don't want people to buy from you without giving you a huge advantage because it might win them the game, the ability to purchase from you. There have been times where cats have bought a bird card from me at four funds uh, such that that was the final action they needed to win the game. And you don't want to be in that situation. So that's a little note on pricing. If your cards are not really that great and you just want people to buy or you want to try and get two buys on a turn from two different people, price it two. If you have valuable cards in your hand or you think that only one person is likely to buy, price it three. If you don't want anyone to buy, price it four. Never past setup and the start of your first turn, price at one. That's a good general pricing guide. But of course, it will depend on the people you're playing against. Um, and one last thing I want to note. I said, if you want two people to buy, price it two. Why would you not price three and hope two people buy? That's because that if you price it two and two people buy, you get two surplus funds. You get two funds more than you would if no one bought from you. That's a pretty big advantage. But imagine if two people buy at three 
they're giving you four more funds than you would if no one bought from you. That's a huge advantage, and that is a sign of a fed otters, which can be very bad for the rest of the table. So it's it's pretty rare that you will secure two buys at a price of three. And so if you really want to try and get two buys, the price of two is a lot more reasonable. So yeah, your riverboats will be of much use to the cult. Blessings of the scaled one to you. Uh, you will almost never see the lizard cult by riverboats. It is very rare. I have seen it happen maybe once or twice and it was in this absolutely incredible run in one of my games on a different map where the lizard, there was a, a crazy clearing setup. Because on the winter map that you have not seen yet, there's different maps. Uh, the winter map has randomized clearing suits. And there was like a all of the clearings up to the cat keep were, across, especially across the river, were the same suit. So they like charged, they uh, used their like... Uh, crusade conspiracy to move to a river clearing and then used river boats to move across the river clearing and then moved into the cat keep and fought them. It was wild. Um, other than that, it's very rare to see river boats ever purchased. So river boats honestly almost never move above two unless, of course, you are in the end game and the ability to use river boats on someone's final turn could win them the game. Our sale was a success. We have a nice variety of funds to use for our actions this turn. You can spend two funds matching the faction of a clearings ruler to place a trade post token and warrior there, so long as that clearing doesn't already have a trade post. So this is the other way to spend funds. I can put a trade post using two funds of spending two funds of the clearings ruler. So I could spend two of my own funds because I rule this bunny clearing to place a bunny trade post. Or I could spend two cat funds because they rule this bunny clearing to place a, a, uh, a bunny trade post as well. And this gives not only two points, but it gives a warrior. However, it does spend funds. So you score two victory points. Trade posts are used to craft, allow you to score dividends, and enable other players to buy more services from you. Um... Yeah, I'll talk about that a bit later. Each trade post you have also built also contributes its suit towards crafting cards. So very important. It is not the physical trade post that is the crafting piece. It is the spot on the otter's board that the trade post came from. So I, every single turn now for the rest of the game, I can, I can commit a fund to craft using one bunny because I have placed a bunny trade post. If my bunny trade post gets removed, it doesn't matter. I can still craft with it. So I'm going to craft this bird card. Um, you must commit a fund for each trade post used during crafting. You have a choice of which faction type to spend. Do I... Do I well, I mean, it's not spend. It's commit. So that's very important. You don't want to call it spending. It's committing. So I'm going to use the lizard. And this decision is one you'll make constantly. You know, which faction's funds do I use for what? Us river folk are great swimmers. We treat rivers as paths during movement and ignore the ruler restriction when moving through rivers. This is very important. River folk, generally, when you play them, you always want to stay along the river. If you move off the river, you generally want to make sure you can come back to the river because it's very easy to get trapped in another clearing and outruled by someone and have it be very difficult to escape other than battling them a bunch, which could be really bad and whittle down your, your low amount of otter forces. Staying along the river is a way to ensure that you can kind of move all across the map without worrying about rule. Let's move two warriors along the river to our trade post to protect it. The Marquis' workshop is vulnerable. Attack. So we could hit for a three here and absolutely obliterate them. And we don't, sadly. From traitor to traitor, I see. You'll pay for this, river scum. Let's 
Let's leave our service cost alone for now. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, it kind of is broke because we talked about why you don't want to price at one. Cats healing up some cats. They don't want to buy from us. Surprise, surprise. Not after that. Each enemy is allowed to buy one service from you a turn, plus an additional service for each going with the trade posts and one of their pieces. So, they can buy mercenaries, and they are going to use... Wait, why are they buying mercenaries? Why? What? I'm so confused. So, one thing to note about mercenaries. When you buy mercenaries you can battle with the mercenaries in the clearings they're in so he had a lizard and an otter here and otters here that the otters join the lizards in battle however when you fight with mercenaries the mercenaries and your own forces split hits so if i am cats if i am the lizards there and i bought mercenaries so i have otters there and i fight cats my forces will take the first hit, the otters will take the second hit, the lizards will take the third hit, the otters will take the fourth hit, and so on. So my otters, the otters that were actually hired as mercenaries didn't appear in the battle because there was only one cat, so it was only possible to get to take one hit. Now, each time a trade post is destroyed, we lose half our funds. This sounds very punishing, but... This only applies if they're in the funds box at the end of your turn. If you commit or spend all of your funds, you have nothing in the payments box. So none of your funds actually, if anyone kills the trade post, it doesn't matter. They want us to recruit. Again, this is not an efficient use of action here. We're going to recruit with one lizard because I want two otters and two lizards available to use for trade posts. So now he's going to say, he's going to talk about dividends, I'm sure. Yeah, here we go. During our bird song, we score dividends so long as we have a trade post on the map. Dividends score one point for every two funds we didn't use on our previous turn. Pass the turn to save funds for dividends. Dividends are an extremely kind of passive way of gaining a middling amount of victory points. I am not a fan of dividends. I very rarely use them. They are so slow and they only work in games that are very entangled where people are not scoring quickly. The problem with dividends is that you gain nothing but points. You don't slow anyone else down. You don't move yourself forward other than in points. You're not getting any new cards in your hand that could prove a huge opportunity to craft down the line. Oftentimes as the river folk, when in doubt, draw cards. Even above your, five, your limit of five, you just draw, 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 especially early in the game. Because that is the best opportunity to get the best cards in the deck. You want coins. You want root T. You want anvil. You want, like, boots and bags. And you want good craftable um, uh, craftable cards. Like, uh, uh, what are they? Like, Propaganda Bureau and Swap Meet and Charm Offensive and Saboteurs. Like, there are so many good cards that are fantastic for you. And by sitting, wasting your turn. I mean, kind of wasting your turn scoring dividends. You're letting your opponents draw all those cards before you do, so that by the time you actually do draw cards, the deck may have already reshuffled and all the coins and root tees are in someone else's hand, so you have nothing to craft. So, very, very rarely will I ever use dividends. I'm going to price everything at two. See if we get a double purchase. I mean, it's kind of unlikely. I don't think anyone's going to pay three. I could I could have priced at three there if the cats may have wanted to buy my bird card. They could have priced, I could have priced at three expecting that they probably both wouldn't buy. But since we're with AI, it doesn't really matter. So this whole idea of protecting trade posts and stuff, you generally will not actually do in a normal game against real people. Like you just don't do dividends. So you don't care about your trade posts because you're going to have nothing in your funds box. Everything's going to be in your committed for the most part, and some of it's going to be spent. So how kind of egregiously we've been spending our funds is is very different from a standard game, and I wouldn't recommend 
spending your funds just to recruit for the hell of it. If you are ever recruiting, it has to be for a very good reason. I need to recruit so I can outrule someone, so I can place a trade post with my own two funds, right? Like, let's say, let's say the cats own this clearing here, and I really wanted to place a trade post there for some reason. I could recruit, um, you know, like, let's say they had uh, two, two cats here, and I wanted to outrule them. So I have no cat funds to place a cat trade post, so I could recruit one otter to get three otters, and then trade post on it because I, I now rule it with my own two otters to get an additional otter and a trade post. So like there's those kind of few situations or you really need to recruit because you need to go fight someone or else they're going to win the game. With that in mind, um, the primary way that otters will recruit, quote unquote recruit through a lot of the early game is by keeping all your otters in the same ball. This is one of the big reasons you keep all your otters together is that you can roll along the river or slightly off the river sometimes with your otters, rule a clearing, put a trade post down, come back to the river, and you had ga you gained an additional otter and got a crafting piece, and uh, you got two points. And that's generally the way it goes. You have your whole otter ball together, you move out, you know, you move off the river, maybe build a trade post, come back to the river or you build a trade post on the river and then you use the warriors you get from placing the trade posts to beef up your ranks because then at least that way if you're spending two funds you're at least getting a crafting piece out of it and you're getting another otter on the map instead of just recruiting and getting an otter and nothing else out of it so that's very important so what they talk what i talked about earlier is coming to pass here looks like we didn't receive any payments this round no matter you move two warriors from your supply to payments as a consolation prize us river folk are innovative crafters instead of resolving the effect of a crafted card we can add a warrior to our payments use the export button to craft for this reward this is okay export is probably the most useless thing possible for the river folk why would we want to export this we could just craft it for a point the reason exporting is so useless is because it puts a fund in my payment. If if I export once, if no one buys, I got less funds than if I hadn't exported and I just wasted a card and an action to do that. I had to commit a fund to craft it just to add a, my own otter into the payments box, which is less than the two otters I would have gotten anyways at the start of the turn. Now, if you know that someone is going to buy from you, you can do this. Or... And, and I mean, I say no, but there, like, Root has a rule for negotiation that says uh, agreements are non-binding. So there, you never, like, 100% know, even when someone tells you they will, that someone will buy. Uh, and the other situation you would, you would export in is if you need your own funds for trade posts. Because let's say I have a ton of lizard funds, but I can't place any trade posts because the lizards have been, like, wiped off the map. So I and they but the lizards just keep buying from me to kind of starve me out of the my ability to place trade posts as they keep buying my cards. This would be very rare. Um in that situation, I need my own funds to place trade posts because lizards don't have any rules. So in that sense, I could export. But yeah. Establish another trade post and score 15 to prove us river folk are more than mere merchants. So Okay. So I'm in a, we really need to just draw some cards. Like generally at the start of the game as River Folk, your first turn, if you go after, if you, if the first turn, if someone else takes the first turn and you come after them, that's a good time to usually set prices at one or two and hope that someone buys and give you surplus funds. 99% of the time, my first turn is literally just drawing cards. It's filling my hand, giving the ability for other people to buy cards from me by giving me juicy stuff and also giving me the ability to figure out what I am going to do. What what am I going to target? what Where am I going to place a trade post? You don't just place trade posts willy-nilly. Um, okay, uh, kind of useless draws, unfortunately. Should have drawn earlier. Um, I'm going to probably place it three because it's likely only one person is going to buy. Um, if anyone does buy. And see, I kind of screwed myself here with that stupid one fun, because now I get one fun less than if I hadn't done that stupid export. But yeah, usually the, the way it goes is my is my very first turn. 
Ooh, nice. There we go. That's the hand card we wanted. So, um, usually my first turn is literally just drawing. Sometimes my second turn is also drawing. And a very good key to key to success as the river folk is to calculate how many funds you're going to need to do whatever you want to do on that turn. Do I want to hit someone? Do I want to draw cards? Uh, do I want to move somewhere to place a trade post? Whatever. Always draw first. Draw first. Calculate how many cards you can or how many funds you can spend. Not spend. How many funds you can commit to drawing before you do anything else. Let's say I want to go over here with the cats and take out these two sawmills. That's pretty juicy. I'm going to say, okay, one fact, one action to move and maybe two actions. Hopefully one action to just kill. But it could be two actions to kill everything. So I calculate, okay, one fun to move. Two funds to battle. That gives me seven funds left. Do I want a trade post? I probably do. To place a mouse in the sack. So that's one, two, three, four, five funds committed. Or three funds committed, two funds spent. I have five funds left. So I could draw five times. And the reason you do this is because what you draw could change what you want to do on your turn. And that's very important. So we're going to draw here. We got another bag we could craft. Okay, let's let's draw again. And a server folk, never really be afraid of drawing past your max hand size. Um, because you're trying to get a hand of, like, a really good hand. So drawing past your max hand size isn't a problem because you can just discard the cards that kind of suck. So we can probably afford one more draw. And unfortunately, we're just drawing into crap here. We're not drawing into the craftables we really want. So now I can attack this building here for one. I can move for two, battle for three, and maybe four. Or uh, no, I can't necessarily battle for three and four. One, two, three, four. Because that wasn't part of the plan, I said. So we move for one, battle for two... Th move for one battle for two and maybe three trade posts and then craft a bag i think that's the play here if i had kind of room I, I kind of forgot this thing was right here i didn't see it um wasn't paying attention so i would have drawn one less if i had remembered that so we're gonna battle the cats and realistically we would need to really check if the cats have an ambush before we do something that like this risky because if they have an ambush then my i mean i just lose i don't rule this clearing and i can't uh you know i can't uh do anything like I, I can't place my trade post so generally you always want to be searching the discard pile and looking at like the revealed hand of the um of the lizard the lizard call and looking in the lost souls and looking for ambushes i don't think there's any ambushes in the tutorial uh no i don't want to recruit one trade post so I got through in one less battle than expected. I'm going to craft. Now you could say, what's the difference between crafting these bags? You want to quickly check the outcast suit. Can I manipulate the outcast? The outcast is going hated bunny. There's two bunny cards in. If I match it with either a mouse or a fox, unfortunately, it's going to stay bunny anyway. So in this case, it doesn't really matter. So we're going to craft the fox one. Okay, and then I normally, if I was in a normal match, I'd move back to the river, but there's no one to really rule here that I need to worry about, so I'm just going to draw. Now, favor cards with the standard deck are nasty, because the river folk can put down a lot of trade posts and then craft favors, which are disgusting. Let's get rid of tax collectors, stand and deliver. Uh, cobbler could be decent for us. We'll get rid of brutal tactics. And we're going to price at, what's the chances someone buys? I don't really have a great hand, so I don't think anyone's paying three for this. So they're crafting. Are they going to defend that? Now, another note I want to make about trade posts. Usually when you're playing otters, uh, you really want to trade post with your own funds first. The reason for that is because early on in the game, when you have a big group of otters, it's very easy to rule clearings because you've got four or five otters. Like people don't have that many warriors on the map, so I can rule and place trade posts. Later in the game, 
your unlikely to rule clearings with your own warriors. People will have smacked your otter ball. You'll be kind of in the dumps. Other people have lots of warriors on the map and buildings. And it'll be really hard to rule. So as a result, you want to save like these lizard funds. I'm not going to be trade posting with them unless I really need to to craft something. Because if I get wiped off the map on my final turn as the river folk, I can just trade post using their funds for the win. So let's say this is my final turn. I need to score 15. This is my final turn. All I have to do is score 15. So now I can use these lizard funds I've saved up without having to move anywhere and literally just go boom, trade post here. And then boom, trade post like here. Now something you have to be mindful of is you can only place three trade posts of each suit. So even if they get wiped off the map. So what that means is you need to make sure that if you have a ton of lizard funds and you're going to place a bunch of trade posts, the lizards are in clearings that you can actually put trade posts in uh, because of how many trade posts you have left. Like if I had already placed three mouse trade posts, I wouldn't be able to place one in these two mouse clearings. So that could change my late game burst. But usually what you'll find with River Folk is they have a very strong late game burst from the funds they've saved up from people buying from them. And they usually don't have many of their own funds in the late game because they've spent them on putting trade posts down. And then there we go. And there's our late game burst. Get our nice four points. So one thing I want to note before we leave as the River Folk is a lot of people, you know, might look at your score as River Folk and say, man, I'm kind of low on score early in the game. Like, I want to place trade posts because other people are flying ahead of me. Um... I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. You should look at every two funds from another faction as two points and just add it to your score every turn. Because I know if I need to, unless I'm maxed out on trade posts, I can just place it down at any time for two points. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind that I may be at zero points because I've been drawing cards for the first two turns. But if people have been buying from me, I'm in reality at maybe four, six points, because I could place those trade posts at any time to get six points with their funds. So don't get discouraged if you're at lower point values. In fact, a lot of my games, I start at low point values and stay at low point values, but then have a lot of high point value turns. I maybe have zero points turn one, zero points turn three, or turn two, and then like four points turn, turn three, four points turn four, and then like maybe five or six points. And then, you know, your last turn can be up to like 10 points. It can get pretty huge. So just keep that in mind. So a lot of information in this one. As you can probably tell, I love otters and I've played a lot of them. So I've got a, I'm kind of a, I guess, fountain of knowledge when it comes to playing the otters. I've played tons and tons of games with them against some pretty good people. So uh, there will be some gameplay coming up next. Um, I'm going to be playing a lot of multiplayer games with friends of mine in one of the Discord servers I'm in. Uh, that are pretty good at the game and so you'll get a good taste of how to play uh, a lot of different factions in multiplayer and actually see them put to use here and also see some mistakes that i make as well so that'll certainly help so yeah but that ends our tutorial series on root at least until the next expansion comes out which should be sometime this quarter so stay tuned for that but get ready to hop into some exciting multiplayer stuff moving forward so for now i'd like to thank you all for watching have a great rest of your day. Cheers, guys.